Well, good afternoon. I'm Ron Haskins from the Brookings Institution and uh, also the NE Casey Foundation. Uh, I'm a somewhat of a scholar, and I go to tons of meetings, conferences all over the country. And the thing that always concerns me is you hear about all these programs, and you re see all kinds of charts with, you know, what the results were and what the program was like, but you never actually see a person who was in any way affected by the program. All you see is, you know, data and analysis and so forth, which is an important part of it. I mean, that's really important. But it, you, you still walk away feeling like you were somewhat deprived because you, you never got to see the people that run the program or the people that are in the program and hopefully benefit from the program. So I want to congratulate the organizers of this conference for ending the day with what the last panel said might be the most interesting panel. Uh, and that is a panel of people who have been directly involved in the program for a very long time. Um, so that's my job here is simply to keep the conversation going, ask some interesting questions. And we're going to begin by uh, asking each of our participants. So we, Kathy Casper from West Virginia uh, and Wesley Jones and um, uh, Sparky Edwards, correct? So I'm going to ask each of them to take about five minutes and tell us their story. What, why they wound up at the, at the National Guard Youth Challenge uh, program and what your experiences were like and then what you've done since. But not in a long, you know, maybe five minutes uh, for each of you and then I want to ask some questions. So, Kathy, why don't you begin? Thank you very much to all of you for hosting this event. This is truly a great opportunity to put the spotlight on something I'm very, very passionate about. I have two degrees. The first one is in business management, and I took that and went to work in the court system. And I found out that there wasn't much hope in the court system. So I went back as a non-traditional student and got a degree in education. And shortly after that, as I was working in the public school system, a newspaper article appeared in December of 1991. And I even brought that newspaper article with me today. I still keep it. It was announcing that Youth Challenge was coming to my area of the state of West Virginia. And I thought, that's exactly the kind of education that I want to be involved in. So I started pestering the Adjutant General's office just a little bit, and we stayed in contact for the next 18 months. I was fortunate to be hired on when the program started in August of 93 in West Virginia as an instructor. And on the day I checked in, the school principal didn't show up. So I also got those tasks. And within two weeks, the deputy director quit, and I also got those tasks. So I did all three jobs for about six months until they hired another instructor. And I served in the position of the deputy director for 18 years. In the last two years, about two years, I have been the program director. I feel just as lucky and fortunate to be involved with the program 20 years later as I did during those first weeks when we were standing up the program. I went to work August 6th and September 14th, we had students on the ground. We had stood the school up because the groundwork had been so well done. We graduated the first class from a challenge program on February the 14th, and it truly was a celebration because we were able to put hope back in the eyes of those children and their families. Thank you. Wesley. Wesley, push the button. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Wesley Jones, graduate of Fort Gordon Youth Challenge in 2008. And um, I was, I think I was led to challenge by a number of things, but primarily in the public school system for me was boredom. I didn't feel challenged with the work that I had, and I would request more work from my teachers when I got done with my work, and they'd said no. So um, if I got in trouble, I realized that my teachers would put me in, a, in the back of a class that was a grade or two higher than mine. And so I said, oh, this, this works. If I, if I get in trouble, I get to go learn new stuff. I get to go learn new things. And so I continue that process of, of making a poor decision to get seemingly good results. But at some point, it stopped yielding good results. And it had uh, went from being a, a way of making decisions to being a lifestyle. Um, and it led to me getting in consistent trouble and a very frustrated mother uh, who, made, who gave me an ultimatum. Uh, at the time, I was involved in gang activity because when I moved from the neighborhood that I lived in and my parents got divorced, 
I moved to a rougher part of town and I was the new kid on the block and people wanted my things and I was outnumbered and I sought security like any kid would and I found it in, I found it in gang lifestyle. So fast forward to uh, when I'm in ninth grade now um, and I guess I'll, I'll venture off and say the point that the, that the gentleman made earlier about ninth grade retention hit me very hard because I, I got kept back twice in ninth grade and at that point I, I just decided it was, it was over for me. Um, so my mother gave me an ultimatum, said either I would stay with my gang or stay with my family and I chose to stay with my gang because I considered it my family. Um, and that didn't yield the best results. Uh, I called her, told her that uh, I was planning on going to Youth Challenge or uh, that I just wanted to turn around. And I went there and I got to see life where I wasn't just that bad kid, you know, that, that knucklehead from the block. I was, I was actually a positive person around positive people who were committed to, to letting me see what I could be. Um, and the challenge staff was there with us every day, whether I was making good decisions or poor decisions, they were there, uh, giving us good counsel and good advice and just pushing us to be everything that we could be. And uh, so from there, I, I, I went on, um, I took all the lessons that I, that I got from there and went forward to be a, a more positive person. But beyond that, just being a person that knows that positive things exist. Um, and so that's, that's why I'm here today. And, I just wanted to thank you all, everybody that's in this room, for caring enough about letting people see something other than the four corners on their block. Thank you. Thank you, Wesley. Spark. My name's Spark Edwards. I come from the Thunderbird Challenge Program uh, 2000 from Oklahoma. Uh, the center touched on my case earlier this morning as that everyone who comes into the program it, is not stereotypical. I came from your regular average working class family not a reason in the world I should have been in trouble. Um, I was the kid with issues, not a kid in a family with issues. Um, the, my mom and others in my support chain started talking to me about the program, and while they were talking to me about it, they were trying to get me interested in it, and from what I had heard through other friends was is that it was a detention program, um, and I was very resistant. Um, they finally convinced me to look at the program, to go out, see the compound, see the cadre. There was an open house day and I found out that it wasn't what I had heard it was, and I fell in love with it and immediately wanted to go start the application process and went through the program. I loved every minute of it. The cadre were perfect role models. The mentor program was the best thing for me. Um, while at the program, I went through recruiter day, and I was one of the few in my class that joined the military. Um, the statistics they talked about this morning is about right. We had a class that graduated around 80, and we had about 10 that went into the military. Um, my recruiter was great, put me in the military, went into the Army, served in field artillery, uh, did a little time as a drill sergeant, and then reclassed over to intelligence. Um, I was in 10 years, ended up getting injured, and got retired September of 2010. Um, they treated me well and gave me a, a good retirement, and uh, I came up here to work in the federal sector. Um, worked in government for about 21 months. Um, when I had stepped away, I had started two international companies, one a security firm, and that is what I'm currently doing. I'm the director of security for the firm. Um, also, my education from the program, they really pushed us to continue education, to always be learning. Um, I started uh, to peak mine by getting my associates in police science, and it charged me, and I just fell right back in love with learning. I got my bachelor's in intelligence studies, and I just actually had my commencement last Saturday for my master's in management, uh, defense management. I had finished back in February, and now I'm starting my Ph.D. in organizational leadership. Uh, the program gave me everything I have. Um, I really don't know where I would be at. I also got mixed up with gangs and had no reason in the world not to. It was just a uh, lack of very big lack of discipline, a lack of sense of direction, and the program gave it to me. And they turned me over to the Army where it continued. And I think that model they talk about with the way the military is, it, it, it truly did. It was what picked me up. Um, most of the graduates that I know that did not make it after the program went home for extended periods of time, one to two, three months, and most all of them that joined the military didn't even make it to basic training. Um, I went home for six days before my basic training because I knew being at home, 
I was going to go right back to where I was. I even took a position in Korea was my first duty assignment, and it was to get as far away from where I was as possible, and it allowed me to start with the, what the challenge program gave to me and build a life for myself. All right, good. Thank you very much. Um, Wesley, tell us a little bit about since you left, how long ago did you leave, and what have you done since you left the National Guard program? Um, I left, I graduated in August of 2008, uh, and after I graduated, I was working at the campus I graduated from as a peer mentor for two years, just uh, basically being, being. Uh, so you worked for the challenge program for a couple of years after you graduated? Yes, sir. I, I worked Great. there. I worked there for two years, being being a peer mentor, basically being someone that the cadets could relate to. And uh, while I was working there, a gentleman named Bud Oster came and uh, offered me a scholarship to go to aviation school. So I went there and got my commercial pilot's license. And uh, I've since the, I've since been going back to school for music engineering, but I do have my commercial pilot's license and I have it because of challenge. So you fly commercial, fly commercial planes? I have the ability to. <laughs> <laughs> I detect a difference. <laughs> Slight. All right. So let me, I want to, um, I've worked a little bit in uh, what we call employment and training programs, yeah, which is a huge deal now because employment's a big problem in the United States. And a lot of employers complain that the, especially kids coming out of high school, are not really prepared to work. <clears throat> and something that a concept that is developed is something called soft skills. And soft skills simply means you show up to work on time, you get along with the people you work with, you can take directions, you respect authority, and so forth. So that probably is an area where a lot of young people, especially young males, fall down nowadays. And they can often get a job, but they can't, don't keep it very long because they don't have these soft skills, uh, never mind actual skills re required for the job. So let me ask you, do you, not just about yourselves, but about the people that you were enrolled with when you were in the challenge program, and I'd love to hear what you have to say about this too, and that is, do you, does the program give you those kinds of skills, the, the importance of being on time, the importance of doing, you know, the tasks at hand and getting it done, working well with others, and those sort of things that employers expect and are very disappointed when people don't have? Do you, did you learn that in the challenge program? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, uh, the littlest thing sometimes, uh, when I'm, if I'm ever running late for a meeting or anything, I, I think, man, someone's going to smoke me when I get there. I mean, someone's going to wreck my world. And uh, it, it, it goes back to those instructors. Were you married at that time? Or? No. <laughs> no. no. Uh, but it, it, goes, it goes even deeper than that because they, they really did reward and instill that value for being on time, for being responsible, for being dedicated, having a sense of purpose and drive. Um, they go as far as to help you write resumes as like they do in high school when you're, when you're graduating. Uh, they give you real world skill sets. There's technical programs in there. There's different uh, skills that you can go into if you kind of know what area you're wanting to go into. But they, they hold you responsible for everything you do. And when they give you these privileges, they can be taken away real quick. Mm -hmm. And you get that real good sense of what I can lose just by being late or being irresponsible. And I think in high schools, you don't get that. You're late, you know, what happens? There, there's not a lot. The, the program holds you responsible. So you're first engulfed in your responsibility as an adult at that program, and you come from it with that. Wes, did you agree? So what was your experience like in this regard? I agree entirely. Um, it's punctuality was, was really important throughout the entire time uh, that I was in Youth Challenge. You woke up and you did, you know, you went through a certain schedule daily, and it was it wasn't about I don't think I personally don't think it was about programming people to do X Y and Z as much as it was about knowing that you have personal responsibilities that you should meet every day, and you have uh, a schedule that will allow you to attain those things or whatever your personal goals are. But I agree with Sparky entirely. If I'm if I'm late for, if I'm late five minutes, I feel like I'm wait, I'm late thirty. It just it's just how it is. Mm -hmm. Not fifteen minutes early, you're late, right? Exactly every time. Kathy, what, you must have a much broader perspective. Is this, are these goals of the program, and how do they try to fulfill them? The whole person concept is totally an accurate way to describe challenge. And we use the expression, you are the sum total of all your experiences at our program. 
and that's very true. And that is a perfect fit for the eight core components, which include these soft skills that we're trying to instill. But it doesn't matter how many awards or ribbons or presentations we have, it's the internal changes. And we start talking about that during the orientation, before you come to challenge. Is this going to be the right fit for you and your family, the kind of education you can get behind and support? So when we do that, we use the term self-discipline, but many parents associate discipline with punishment. So we've changed that to self-structure. We're gonna use standards, we're going to use a training schedule, and we're gonna use the appropriate staff to help teach you some time management, some organizational skills, that no matter what you do in life, you're gonna be able to take those skills with you wherever you go. You're gonna go from being someone who makes bad choices to someone who makes good choices. And you do that because you know internally the benefit that can pay for you. And with that comes a sense of great pride. So, uh, Wesley and Sparky, Kathy talked about bad choices and good choices. I think one of the things, and this really was implicit in Hugh's point, uh, uh, when he talked about the classmates that he knew that were he called them knuckleheads, I think, and you said knuckleheads too. You're the only kid I ever heard say knucklehead. I thought that expression went out with World War II, but uh, uh, that's that's just about when uh, Hugh was going into college was World War II. Um, so here here's the question. Hugh says he saw the kids later. They were in the military. They were ramrod straight. They looked good. They sounded good. They stayed out of trouble. This is my question. What do you think it is about the room? Both of you, by the way, said you had been in trouble and were in trouble at the moment you went in. And you even said that you didn't want to go back where you live because you're afraid you'd fall right back into it. So what is it about the program that helps kids stay out of trouble? What, what, what was it that helped you and your other classmates? And especially if you had classmates that you followed after they left and they got back in trouble, why do you think that happened? What, what, what do these programs have to do to keep kids from getting in trouble? Uh, one of the things that I've noticed, just because I, I great world of social media now, I stay in contact with a lot of the graduates, Facebook and different things. Um, I've noticed just personally, because I, I ask every one of them, you know, where they're at, the most successful ones that I knew, or I, I know currently, they, they didn't go home for very long, or they had some type of job lined up. Someone was there to help them when they got out with, with either education, scholarships, something. Um, one of the guys, uh, Jonathan Berger, is a OSBI, Oklahoma State Bureau investigator right now. He got out and had a mentor there ready with a job and to get him away from it. I don't know anybody who went back home to their hometown with just, just what they had left, just their stipend and trying to keep up with their mentor that actually made it. I don't know of any from my class at least. Um, going home and going back in those old habits, you know, the challenge program can give you a whole bunch of tools and the things you need to succeed. But as she said, is it, it's in us. And when you go home, it, it's hard. Old habits do die hard. And um, but from what I've noticed, it, it's that follow-on after the program and where they go from there. And the Army is a great catalyst for that carry out of that. Did the program do anything after you left? Was there any plan or I, you've told us what you actually did did the program play a role in that or did you work that out yourself or yeah uh you know there's, there's a lot of different things that when you're leading up to the graduation um you know from resume writing to getting some certain skills on, on the computer at that time because uh, you know, 14 years ago yeah computers were out but there was a, a lot of emerging technologies um and they were like, hey what do you want to do you know it there was college credits available so there, there was a variety of things we could do up to graduation. Um, the follow-ons, uh, one of the biggest things was the career day for the military. You were required, if you went, no matter what, to talk to every, every branch of recruiter. And I did. Got to explore it, got to look at what I truly wanted, and that was my match. Um, others found college credit, and that's what they did. They left and went straight to school. Others got a skill set from a VOTEC or a program, and they went into IT. Um, some of us were volunteering at state parks. They went into parks management. I mean, there, there were so many avenues that the program offered us up at, right there before graduation that we take advantage of. And, but it was truly up to you to do it. 
Um, other than that, you can sit back and go on cruise control. Like they said, it's it's voluntary, and, and there's a lot of cadets that do it. And there's a lot of them that just graduate, like I, I graduated from high school, but that's that's all they want. And, and it's sad, but it's truly up to you. But there's great programs in there. Um, just to piggyback off what Sparky said, it's it really is a lot a lot about whether or not you you go back um, because it's almost it's in a sense similar to going back to high school if it didn't work for you the first time you know, there, nothing really changes about your environment you go back to the environment you came from and the same people are still there and the same things are still happening um, so like me personally when I graduated I left I was around I was on campus at Youth Challenge so often that people thought I moved when I graduated I was never there and then I moved to Arizona for school and I moved to Minnesota and I moved to Kansas and after doing all this moving around, recently I went back, I went back to my hometown and I was just walking around and I, I began to look around and say, wow, this is, these are, this is the same group of individuals I was with three years ago and we're, we're doing the same thing right now. You know, I still see them doing the same thing. It's almost like there's a, in cert, I guess in, in certain areas or in, in certain places, it's almost like life is just paused there. And if you go back to where it's paused, then you're going to be in the same, the same scene, more or less. So I think escaping from that mentally and thereby escaping from that physically has a lot to do with what people do after they graduate, or at least me personally. There's a definition of insanity that says it's when you do the same thing time after time after time and you expect a different result. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's what both of you are saying, that if you go back to the situation you came out of that caused the problems that you were having in the first place, then you're going to have disaster. So if that's true, then you would expect the uh, challenge program, and especially with the outcomes uh, that we know about because of the evaluation, that w one thing that they must try to do is to help the kids avoid what happened to them before, so help them make plans and so forth. Tell us about that. We have a very formal process within Challenge to help deal with this, and it's two phase. One, we start working in the application phase identifying mentors. So as the child's coming in the door, we are already collecting potential mentors that can help them, not just after graduation, but during that process people that can help them network and communicate with schools and things back home or in totally different areas to help them expand those goals. So the mentoring component is a very strong, unique thing to challenge. But we also have a very formalized goal planning course that all the students go through and they develop what we call the PRAP, the Post-Residential Action Plan. And we start that during the residential phase. And we teach them how to build SMART goals, things that are realistic. I would love to have been Dorothy Hamill in my childhood, so that <laughs> dates me. <laughs> Only problem was there wasn't a skating rink within 100 miles of me. And we would have a lot of students that would come in with a goal to, well, I'm going to play professional basketball. But is that realistic? Are you on that track? So we have to take it one step at a time and make sure that those are specific and measurable and attainable. So we put all those things together in a plan and we practice that during the residential phase. What are your goals for the next three weeks, for the next six months? And as they're learning that and learning how to focus on themselves and their life, then they start to get that sense of empowerment that I really have control and opportunities that I can focus on after I leave challenge, I have that skill set now. And it's not being selfish because I've left the problems of my home environment behind. I can come back to that environment as an adult and help out with my family. But to do that, I have to focus on me now. And so we're building that action plan. And they've had experience with the goal planning. They've seen it work. So they can take that into the next phase of their life. And we call that post-res. Um, on the specific issue of going back to their hometown, their own home, their own situation, does that concern you if that's going to happen? Do you, do you have a program that you systematically try to figure out a way to keep them from going back to exactly where they came from? And if you find out that a graduate is going to go back, does that concern you? 
we don't have a lot of the issues in West Virginia that these young folks have described. So our problem is employment opportunities. So we're concerned if someone is going back to a home environment where there's no potential for school or employment. So those are our two big focuses that we're trying to get everybody into that. Either they have a job to go home to or we're gonna find an educational opportunity for them. So those are our two focuses. Uh, Sparky, um, Kathy mentioned mentors and we've heard about mentors several times today and I can tell you there's quite a research literature on mentors as well. Did you have a mentor? Did the other kids in your program have a mentor? Talk to us about your own feelings about having mentors. Yeah, everybody in the program, uh, it was required to have a mentor. Um, if you couldn't find one, they did have methods for teaming you up with volunteer mentors. Um, during during my course, um, yeah, we I got to hear the stories, you know, while I was in the program as a cadet. There was some mentors that were letting their cadets do the wrong thing. And that's something, you know, that that's a mentor's failure and they're failing the cadet at that point. But for the most part, the mentors are getting trained, they're getting programs, they're getting outreach, they're getting special assistance and helping them to be a mentor properly with the special needs that we had in the program. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, my wife became a mentor for the Tar Heel Challenge for a teen down in uh, North Carolina. And I played a big part in that because I'd been there and I was, my wife was never exposed to that type of life. So she was a great role model but at the same time, I knew what the team was going through. So I was kind of going through my wife and helping her to understand and back and forth. And um, it's- What do you mean by team? You say a team, what's a team? What, what, are, what are you referring to? With the, especially with the females, it had to be a mentor on cadet. That's all you have. So my wife may come home and said, oh, she's having these issues or she's, um, you know, the cadre, they're doing this or this. And I'd help her to understand what she meant. It's like she's speaking a different language because the cadets do somewhat have a different vocabulary than their mentors oftentimes, especially with my wife and, and this one. I was so, in an altar and I noticed that a lot of guys had a different vocabulary. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you were in a whole new language. So it, it was a lot of, uh, I guess I was helping my wife more than anything, but it did help the cadet. But getting to see some of the mentors, I'd take her on mentor day to drop her off and seeing some of the mentors and what they were doing, how they interact um, during the days they would allow me to go to lunch. There'd be a restaurant full of mentors and getting to listen on conversations. I, I'm always, I'm a person that pays attention. Uh, the mentors play a huge role. They're, they're, they're a huge impact on them. And they're the, the people that they're supposed to go to. Once you graduate, your mentor is the person you go to. Um, most, the programs I know of, you know, there's certain rules, um, you know, family member wise and how the mentors have to be structured, certain training the mentors have to commit to. Um, and then having a mentor that is committed is, is very important. You know, they back out halfway through the program, that may be the only person that cadet has that they see as that figure in their life that just quit on them. And everybody else in their life could have already quit on them. And now, now they're in the middle of this program it, it, it could drive them to quit because like, she, like they've been saying today, it's voluntary. And I'll tell you what, they, they will, cadets will leave at the, at, at the littlest thing, they'll leave. Wesley, how about you? Do you have a mentor and uh, did you, you feel your mentor helped you? And also talking about the other kids there, did they have mentors and does, uh, in your view, does the mentorship program work? Um, I think the mentorship program works. It personally worked for me. My mentor was somebody that uh, I had grown up with. He went to my church, he was a deacon at my church, and he was there for me as a mentor before I went to Challenge, but it became more important to me uh, what having a mentor was while I was there because there was days when I wanted to go home. I really did. Um, and just having someone there say, no, you, know, you, you don't understand right now, but in two or three years, you'll understand why it's so important that you stay there. Um, if you don't have that voice and you're just operating based off of what you see in front of you at the time or what you comprehend, then it, it's really, it gets really difficult to navigate uh, through your choices. And as far as uh, seeing other, other cadets and their mentors, I could see the same effect in them. Um, and it, it kind of changes the way you look at your mentor because it's like, well, I see. I see what my mentor said, I see what he said. Somebody's gotta be telling the truth here. If everybody's saying stay here, I might need to stay here. Um, so 
I, I think the mentorship program works. It worked for me and it worked for everyone that I, that I experienced. For both of you, from, uh, from the perspective, not just your own, but uh, other people in the program with you, was there generally a respect for the mentors? Did the most people, most of the kids in the program feel that this was an important part of the program and they had a good mentor and the mentor actually had influence on them? Yeah, I never saw any anything opposite of that. They, they always had some type of respect. And honestly, you, you, the first part of the program, you're so cut off, you know, through Hell Week and then different things that that mentor is, is a treat. To get to see your mentor, someone from the outside, outside the walls, was was a big deal. Uh, one thing that the program did um, incorporate and allow is even if you were in trouble, say you had messed up because most kids at some point are going to get in trouble in the program, they do something, um, you may not be able to leave, but they still allow your mentor to come and talk to you. They The, the program sees the mentor as such an important role that no matter what you're doing or where you're at in the program, that mentor has access to you. They'll bring them in, they use them, and it truly is. It's a treat. It, it, it's um, The respect is there. I think it's almost uh, compelling in a way that you, you don't have a choice to, and, and, and it really is, in, but it's in a good way. Um, I never saw the opposite of that, though, ever, in any mentor that, that I was exposed to. Wesley, you agree with that? I agree. Um, and when you, have, when you have a mentor, when you do get in trouble, that's when you really need the mentor the most. Uh, when when things are peaceful, it's kind of it's kind of easy to kind of easy to be able to stay. But when you you get in trouble and someone has to come say, "Well, yeah, that was that was a poor decision," uh, it's it makes it very important that they still allow you to see them. But I agree with that entirely. One one of the keys to the mentor is the trust factor between the cadet and the mentor. And the program a lot of times you know educates the mentor not to go running back to the parents and tell them things and. There has to be a bond between that mentor and the cadet that truly the parents don't have access to the kids or the cadets like the mentor does. The mentor is almost explicit access. Parents don't get that. So a lot of times parents are going at mentors trying to pry information, but it's real important. And, and the, I know the Challenge Program expresses to the mentors that to keep that confidentiality between them, you know, to a certain extent, of course. But um, that is key, and, and we got that in North Carolina with ours. It, it was pivotal that – our uh, the cadet she was mentoring their parents lived across the street from us uh, and believe me it wasn't a, in a good way with with the mentor program because they were constantly wanting to know things and yeah. but it was so important to keep that respect there and, and uh, sounds like keep something like privacy between the cadet and the mentor yeah once you break that bond of trust I, I can imagine a full shutdown would not be far from that with the mentor and the cadet so Kathy you've been seeing this, seeing this program from several different perspectives uh, I've been involved a little bit with mentors and read a little bit about it. Uh, a number of programs have problems, A, recruiting mentors, and B, retaining mentors. How do you recruit mentors? What kind of people do you try to get? Do you have trouble keeping them? And above all, this point that I think Sparky made about if they quit in the middle, or maybe, maybe you made this point, but if they stop in the – well, the cadet, cadet is probably through the program. It really has a negative impact on them, so that shows you – how important this is you got to get the right kind of people so tell us about that we use a youth initiated mentoring strategy so we're trying to build friendly matches so as the student is applying to come into the program we're asking them to get two or three people they already know that are positive working role models and we coach during the orientation we coach the parents on who those good fits would be because that way we're not starting from ground zero. We're starting with someone that they know and trust or respect. Because if you think about it, what a tremendous compliment it is if a young person in your community comes to you and says, I respect you enough in what you do to help me get to the next step in my life. So that's the basis. Secondary to that, if we have someone anywhere in our state that absolutely cannot come up with a mentor that does not stop that child from taking advantage of challenge because it's the kids first. We have an entire network of citizen soldiers in West Virginia and we are fortunate in our state to be part of the guard mission and every Wednesday during the adjutant general's leadership meeting he asked the question what have you done for challenge this week? So we have that resource to help match people in their home community 
with a trained mentor. So these are usually former National Guardsmen that you, uh, join your network and get the training and all that, and they're uh, available in case a kid cannot find them? At Correct. That's our first line. And then we use civic organizations within the communities mm -hmm. to help us as well because giving back to the community is always part of their mission. Mm -hmm. So we've established a network to help recruit mentors. Do you, I don't know if you know about the national program, but is that the way it's usually done? Uh, that they involve the family, involve the, the adolescent, and they play a big role in selecting the mentor? Or is it selected for them by the program? No, this is national, nationally. Okay. This is part of our post-residential training manual. And so the experience is that that works pretty well. You don't have yes. this problem of mentors quitting and all that. Occasionally we do. We'll have someone that moves, mm -hmm. you know, for a job. You know, mm -hmm. we have that. And that's why we ask all the students to come up with two or three. Mm -hmm. And we try to train as many of them as we can so that mm -hmm. if the number one cannot fulfill the obligation, we're ready to go with the second. All right, it's obvious to anybody in this room uh, that y'all are quite pleased with the program. I have a feeling that might have part of the reason that they were selected. Uh, but I have yet to hear about a program that doesn't have some problems. So think back over your experience in the program or since the program, and really now, what level with this, what are the things that you think are the weakest that should be improved that would really help the program if they could do it better? You don't have to say it was the weakest, but use that in your selection and tell us the things that you think should happen to improve the program. Um, I guess I'm talking a couple that I've noticed, but it's been 14 years since I was at my program and I've talked to some of the directors, the Commandant, Commandant Edwards is still there um, and they've made some huge changes. They probably fixed the concerns that I know of. Um, while I was there, it was a little too easy to quit. Um, there, there was you know speed bumps that they would try to run interference and counselors and talk to them and mentors but to me it was still just too easy and maybe at that time being a cadet you know I didn't fully know how hard it truly was but they were there and they were gone and um, in some ways it's good for the rest of the kids they don't want to be there at the same time I, I kind of thought it was a little too easy for them to leave um, also the uh, after there, there was a stipend and then there was the mentor now i didn't get to get too involved in a lot of the what i call aftercare i don't know the, the post-residential phase um because i, I yeah program. i was gone yeah. so i don't know um I, I just know a lot of people that went back home didn't make it that may have nothing to do with the challenge program so I, i'm sure that were 14 years a lot of those gaps have been filled and fixed um, matter of fact, I think at the GLAW, I, I talked to the Oklahoma uh, member that was there, and she had told me that, that, yeah, they had done great strides in those areas. Question. That's a tough question. I'm really, because I love the program, so I've been racking my brain trying to come up with an answer. Um, I think probably the closest that I could come, uh, come up with is possibly emphasizing the, the importance of the post-residential uh, pro process more to the, to the cadets mm -hmm. so that they don't feel like you're, they're, uh, they, they walk out of the gate, they, they get their cap and gown and, and it's all over. Um, I think it should, be, it should be emphasized a lot more that it's, it's really important that you follow up on those 12 months, whether you're doing good, whether you're doing bad, uh, no matter what, it's important that you follow up on those 12 months because the people that are calling you or uh, getting in contact with you in that post-residential phase, the, the same people that cared for you the, same, the six months you were there. Right. So that's probably. Kathy, uh, I'm gonna ask you the same question, but I'm gonna use different words because you're in the program, you are the program. Uh, so if you criticize, you'd be criticizing yourself. But tell us the, the, the parts of the program, either before people get there or while they're there or afterwards, that are the greatest challenge for the administration of the program. I'm going to pick up on one of the things that uh, Sparky mentioned, and that was too easy to quit. And we've tried to build in all kinds of procedures. It's not easy to get in, and it's not easy to get out. And we brief that at the orientation so the families know and understand. You have to be committed as a family, because they've already shown up at the orientation, that tells us that they value their child, and their education and yet we still have students that run or walk off 
and we struggle with that and say, why is that? This is the perfect opportunity. Why would you walk away? Well, we've trained our students to walk away from bad situations. Instead of fighting or get, getting aggressive or arguing or being disrespectful, it's better to walk away. And sometimes they just need to cool down. So whether you're a professional and you call that elopement or away from supervision, or whether you're in the military and call it AWOL, we still deal with that. So that hasn't gone away, but we've laid the foundation through the orientation process to help reduce the number of times that we've done that. We really need as a program to make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of public school because what the students tell us that they like and benefit from in the educational arena are small class sizes and knowing that someone cares. It matters whether they're there. They know my name. And so immediately, as soon as our students hit the ground, the staff's first function is to learn their names. No nicknames, no knuckleheads, and we've had that before. I think that comes from the Marine Corps, at least on our staff it did. So you have uh, to know. The Marine Corps has much more colorful <laughs> language than that, I, I assure you. So we want them to know that from the time they show up at the orientation and they register on opening day, from that point forward, you belong to the challenge family. You matter to us. And so it's not gonna be easy for you to quit and give up on yourself. So we know we don't wanna get class sizes that are too big or staffs that are too small. And we have to have the appropriate staff who can really coach and mentor these people to the next step in their life. Truancy is epidemic and it is starting at the elementary school levels. Some of the counties in West Virginia have hundreds of families in the court system for truancy issues. And it just continues to grow through junior high and high school. So we have to look at, in our cooperative agreement, the terminology we're using to identify the population we serve. Is it only the dropout or is it the student who is not attending school? Because I'm here to tell you that public schools will keep those names on the list because there's dollars involved with those names. But yet those students are not there and they're not participating. So we need to make sure that we can capture as many out of school students as we can to help get them the credential they need to launch into their adult life. And we need to make sure that we're giving credentials to these students that are gonna help them and get them to the next step. And I'm very proud of a couple initiatives that we've been able to do in West Virginia and hopefully we'll be able to replicate in other challenge states. In 2005, we became recognized as a special alternative education program by law. What does that mean? Any high school in the state could use us as an alternative ed site and that student could transfer to the challenge program. And you would get the money? We did not take the money. The schools kept the money. We did the work and just this year, actually last Friday, we were able to present an award on behalf of those home high schools, high school diplomas. We estimated that with our history of how far we had come, it's West Virginia, I need to brag a little bit. West Virginia is 12 and a half points higher than the national challenge average for GED success. And we test everybody, and we always have. So with that background, we thought 30 to 40% of our student population would be able to take all the steps necessary to earn the high school diploma. I'm here to tell you we got 70% of our graduates high school diplomas Friday. So those two initiatives are gonna help the students down the road. We never had a problem getting a GED student an ACT Promise Scholarship in West Virginia or getting into community college. But we have struggled with tier one status with the military. And this is a DOD program. So maybe that high school credential was gonna be the piece for all of us 
that helps flip that over and help us get tier one status for our graduates. Great. Okay, audience. Do we have questions from the audience for any of our pan panel members? Yes, right here. We, we, there'll be a microphone, and if you would please just stand up and tell us your name. Hi, my name is Jessica Washington. Um, I have a question for both of you. Um, I know this program is voluntary, and I want to first applaud you all for taking that step to realize that you all needed to change. But we all know that um, all, dropout, all dropouts aren't necessarily created equal, and everybody doesn't um, have that drive to do better. So I want to know what was the breaking point for you, I guess, or what kind of like spurred that epiphany, like, hey, I really need to change my life and I need to turn around. Uh, you know, I, I watch some of these shows like Intervention and some of the addiction shows, and it shows that rock bottom. Um, and for me, there, there was a rock bottom. Um, I remember it was Mother's Day, and I got in some trouble and broke some laws. And uh, I'd never seen my mom cry over me getting in trouble, and it was Mother's Day of all days. And um, she'd been talking to me about the program for about a month at that point, and I realized that was my rock bottom, what I was doing to my family personally. Um, like I said, I came from a great family, so to see my family in the array and the, in, in the shambles I was putting it in was my rock bottom. And I think a lot of graduates that I heard stories from they didn't agree to go to the program usually until they hit their rock bottom and everybody's got a different rock bottom it just depends on their situation and what it is but i compare a lot to like an addiction and it's truly when you hit rock bottom and it is a last resort resort oftentimes so i think that puts some of the graduates in who run and when she said run that's literal i mean i had kids crawling over me in the middle of the night to get out to run out the back door and take off down the street so they do run um but uh it is um, a key to your success, too, because that's all you have. And one of the things they brief you on on the day of intake is that you're at your rock bottom. This is it. And they let you know you're down here, but we're going to get you where you need to be. And um, that, that was the key to my success. I don't think – I know some people's rock bottoms go from being okay to just a drastic – uh, decline, but for me it was gradual. Uh, after getting put out of school and moving to Atlanta and getting put out of my mother's house, I kind of hung around with the same gang, the same type of gang affiliation that I had in Augusta, and I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, which is a little rougher than Augusta is. And I uh, went to an event at Centennial Park with my family, and I saw some people from an opposing gang, and. Uh, one person walked by and that was fine with me. It really didn't rub me wrong. And then the second walked by and I kind of got a little irritated. And the third walked by and I took his bandana. And as in in gang lifestyle, bandana is is your identity. So um, I took that and uh, threw it on the ground. And uh, I got into an altercation there that that left me with a couple broken ribs. And um, I couldn't tell my mom and I couldn't tell my dad who I was living with at the time. On the other hand, you couldn't walk, so. Well, that, was a, that was a problem, too. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, there, there's that issue. But I, I, had, I really had to sit back and, and think about it. It's like, you know, this sucks, but it could be so much worse. And if I continue this lifestyle for doing this, thing, it's, uh, I don't get a retirement plan from game banging. You know, nothing, nothing comes from this, you know. If, I, if that altercation had went further than it did, then you know, no, no tears would have been dropped aside from that of my actual family. Um, and so that was, that was my rock bottom. I couldn't, I couldn't continue after that point. And I think the, the difference too, we've been talking about this a lot today, uh, difference in where, where we all come from. Atlanta, Georgia, you know, one of the roughest cities in the nation. I came from Fort Gibson, Oklahoma. Yeah, you've probably never heard of it. It's right next to Muskogee. Um, oh, you know, yeah. they, they, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think they put a stoplight in a few years ago just to say they have a stoplight. So you can see, I mean, from Atlanta, Georgia to small town, Oklahoma, oldest town west of the Mississippi, you know, it, it, um, it, it hits everywhere. It, it really is a problem across the country, no matter where our youth are. It truly is a huge problem. Call one time I lived in North Carolina and we used to go to the beach and took a whole bunch of people from work 
and there was a new person that we'd hired who was quite young, and she was from rural North Carolina. And to get there in the old days, you go through a city called Fuquay, Verena. So we're driving, and we had made jokes about a, what a rural, you know, hick town and all this. And she's sitting in the car, and we go through there. And she's, well, you know, she said, it can't be that small. They have a McDonald's. <laughs> Another question. Yes, here. Wait, wait till you get the microphone. Okay. Thank you. It's wonderful to hear you guys. Um, I'm Jim Crotty, by the way. I write about education uh, and have run after school programs. And the, the thing that struck me is like the importance of real structure in a young person's life. I was fortunate. My dad, though, he's, you know, Great Depression, you know, worked five jobs, put themselves through college, et cetera, ended up being a doctor. Um, and, uh, and, you know, he was fortunate in his situation. Uh, I had the benefits of growing up with him and his deep sense of structure, and that helped me. But the thing that I think you guys probably faced and people in your program faced, the same problems I faced, I mean, I didn't go to the military for various reasons, but I ended up becoming, a, very strangely, a Zen Buddhist, and there's this very samurai approach in Zen Buddhism where you have to sit for 90 days, not talk, not look at anybody in the eye, get up at 3.30, go to bed at 10. It's military, basically. And the, in, in Korea, I was in a Korean Zen Buddhist center, and they, and they said, you know, the, the name of that 90-day retreat, it's like a boot camp. They call it Kilche, which is hard training. And then they have a term called Heije, which is soft training. And they said, the hardest part is Heije, is the soft training. That is, there's certain comfort that comes from being in the structure I mean, you do go through the hell, and you have your breakdown, and I broke down and cried. I said, I can't do it, you know? I'm like 23 years old. Get me out of here. I want to leave. And I hung in there, and then I got to love it because I knew when I was going to eat every day. I knew it was expected of me. The rituals were the same. You had your own, like you said, we had our own language. Even though we didn't talk, there was a certain ritual to everything. And the hardest part was getting out and, like, the world doesn't act this way. And they really don't. And you want the world to now be the way you know how to do the world. So I want you to just talk a little bit more about that because to me it was really, really hard once I got out. It was to me too. And it still is to some, to some degree because I, I got used to waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning and going to do PT and... Uh, doing all the, all the things that were youth challenged. And then I graduated and I was like, well, this isn't right. What, what do I do now? There's no schedule. What? Okay. Um, but yeah, I would, I would agree. That is, that is the toughest part. But I think in my personal life, the foundation that, that youth challenge gave me to be able to set my own schedule, um, still, still be able to, to follow a schedule, but to know how to set my own and be able to stick to it as opposed to just saying, well, I'm going to do this and I might do it and I might not, um, was, was really beneficial for me in the long run. Uh, not having structure, I think, was my downfall before the program. Um, of course, at that point, didn't know. Uh, once I got in, I fell in love with it. Uh, I fell in love with the discipline, fell in love with the structure. And uh, luckily, I went to the military and was in it for a while, and I lived it. So I didn't have to face that now. September 2010, when I was retired, you would have saw one of the most scared individuals, I think, in the world, because I was scared to death of what I was about to face. And it, it took me a while, and I still worked through it, and that's coupled with, you know, war stressors to military stressors to structure stressors. But um, it, it's, it's still ongoing, and it's things I still deal with, but um, I create my own structure, and I, I still live in my own. But uh, when I see organizations, uh, work environments, schools that don't have structure, it, it makes me uncomfortable. I think that's about the extent. Um, I, I don't like it at all. Right. I think my benefit There's was some, the some strange thing here that they both have said, really, that essentially the same thing, which is the experience of having that structure that they didn't have before they went to the challenge program, that they were able 
not necessarily have as much and not to have to depend on someone else to send it, to set it, but you set it yourself. You knew how important it was. So that's, I think that's really the, the most crucial point. Kathy wants to say something. When you're at challenge, we take away a lot of the distractors. Our students don't bring technology with them. We don't watch television. So they learn in this environment how to prioritize. And we incorporate that into the post-residential action plan and their goal planning class. What are you gonna do day one when you're home without challenge? And the goal is to have each cadet leave the program knowing where they are going to be on Monday morning, that first week without challenge. I'm gonna give you an example, and this is true. We graduated on Friday, and Tuesday evening I was working late and got a phone call, and it was Cadet Eddie Wise. Mrs. Tasker, I, I need to talk to my case manager. I'm so excited. I started my new job today. I interviewed yesterday, and today was my first day I'm going to work long hours, and I'm going to love it because I'm, 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 I'm just out there, and I want everyone to know. I said, Eddie, that's great. You're the first one to call in. What are you doing? I got hired by an escort service. <laughs> now, as an adult, see, your mind went right where mine did. <laughs> but he's going to be working driving cross-country as one of the flag cars that is required as they travel cross-country and he wanted to travel and see the, the world. And he doesn't turn 18 until the fall, and he wanted to have some experience other than just going back home. So he took that job, he's training for it, he's thrilled to death. So I have a cadet in the escort business. <laughs> Another question, back here in the back. My name's John Dias and I'm uh, with the uh, National Guard Youth Foundation. I'm relatively new, and one of my duties is to help the board raise money to support uh, the National Guard Youth uh, Challenge programs across the country, and in particular, <clears throat> to help raise resources nationally that help our graduates move on to that next phase of their life. A question for our two young gentlemen. If uh, somebody were to come to you and said, we've got all the money and all the ideas and all the leadership in the world, but we want you to tell us the answer on how to place those ideas and leadership and money. And we want you to answer the question, what would it take for 18-year-olds for who now have their GED? Uh, they're not going to go to the military. They're not going to college. That 70% of the 18-year-old graduates got a new GED. What would it take, money, resources, opportunity, for them to go into a sophisticated job training job workforce development program, what would it take for them to sign up to go into an intensive 10-week, 20-week program, a residential program, go to some another city to get some training? What would it take to ensure that every graduate got into a workforce development job training program and actually had the responsibility of securing their job before they left that? I think everybody's got their different uh, what it what would it take for them um, to try to generalize it as, as a task in itself that would you know almost sum up the problem, um, but that that kind of type of creation for going somewhere, going to a job training field, um, getting them skill sets or certification credentials as she was saying because one of the things is the the program's so short in a sense you, you really can't get any large credentials that are truly pivotal right now in the market so being able to put a graduate in a program to get them some type of IT certification uh, some type of spreadsheet or office or business uh, certification would be huge for them in the job market um, what would it take I, I think the opportunity the program the, the the positions the companies to assist um, money to keep them afloat or as far as to earn a paycheck while they're doing these programs. Um, most of the certification and credentials programs are just a couple months. Uh, so in relative terms, yeah, on a large scale, it's probably a lot of money, um, but it's not that much in what we're going to be paying for them if they don't succeed or if they don't go anywhere after the program. Um, as we've talked about, with, I, I know quite a few from my program who wound up back in jail. So 
I think just having that resource there, having uh, programs that are committed to helping them after they graduate and putting them in those. Um, at the Goa, I talked to quite a few people who were talking about their programs. I think it was some of them for California, uh, what was one of them, Sunny? Some Sunburst. Sunburst. Yeah. And they had some uh, corporations that were placing graduates in, in IT training and different program certifications and paying them, you know, as what, like, um, anybody entry would be. Um, mm -hmm. But it was enough to give them purpose, responsibility, to complete that certification, and then offering them a job, entry level usually somewhere, and uh, totally changing everything that they're looking at after they graduate. I would, uh, I would say that the... A big thing that would that it would take is is just continuing to listen, um, continuing to listen to them and what their personal desires are, where they want to go in life. Um, because as long as you listen, as long as you listen and they feel like they can trust you, then they'll tell you what they want to do. Um, and so just just continuing to listen to figure out where they want to go and from there how to get how to help them get to that place. Any other questions? All right. So I think our uh, you want to. Tell people where to go to get, are you going to give them booze or what are you doing here? In fact, let me, let me say something. Um, I've been involved in research for a long time and uh, last couple of years I've been uh, doing a, a study of the Obama administration's evidence-based initiatives. And one thing that I've learned during this period, this is really interesting, about 80 to 90 percent of programs that are evaluated by random assignment design fail. They do not produce the outcome that they were designed to produce. That, that was suggested in one of the previous panels. And this is true in business as well. So to have a program here that the first time it was evaluated in a serious random assignment design produced a big impact, is it's really amazing. Uh, and it says something about, I think what it really says something about is the concept, the idea. It's a, such a solid idea. And of course, there's a tremendous need for it. And to have the military involved, I think that was that's another uh, essential ingredient to model the thing on discipline and self-responsibility and so forth. Those are all crucial elements. But it is a it is a great thing and it's a tremendous compliment to the program that this has been proven to actually produce results with the kind of people you find out there in the countryside that are really having trouble and they join a program that's not some kind of hot house, university affiliated, you know, it's they're all over the country. I think I saw thirty or 37 sites, something like that. I think eight of them were in the evaluation. So it's really a remarkable thing that this program has been shown to be effective. Everybody claims to be effective, but 90% of them are not. Well, Ron, thanks very much for moderating this panel. And I thank all our panelists for a terrific job. It was fascinating to listen to you. Um, before I turn you loose to the reception, I want to thank a few other people. I think all our panelists deserve thanks because they were willing, they care about this program a lot, this problem a lot, and they wanted to come talk about it. I want to thank you all for participating in this, and bear with me for just a moment. I want to thank John Hamry at CSIS and Craig McKinley and, and Gail Dady at the Foundation for supporting this, and I want to make some particular. Chris Jane for putting this together, Ashley Saunders, for doing really a lot of the, most of the hard work. Nicole Darden here at CSIS for doing a terrific job in getting this together and, and a lot of other volunteers that were around from CSIS and other in the foundation for helping out. So we want to thank you for doing this. Uh, we appreciate your interest in this issue. Everybody in the country needs, needs, needs all of our help on this. So please stay in, at the reception and enjoy yourself and thanks again for coming. Happy.